Hi everyone, Jonathan back again with something vintage for you. We do like to include a few older things in this series. A beautifully cased set of pistols, as you can see. Some great historical information on this label in the lid, which I'll uh, explain in just a moment, but let's get one out so I'm not just talking. So, loosely speaking, a percussion pistol. Um, but we're used to the word percussion, meaning copper caps, that you're probably familiar with. It was the ignition system of uh, the American Civil War, the Crimean War, where you where we've moved on from flintlock. We, we now have uh, the cock has now become a hammer that literally smacks something to explode, to create the flame, to ignite the charge in the barrel. That's typically a cap. Um, <laughs> debates over who invented that. Joseph Egg in England is, is usually cited as the, as the inventor. Um, there's a Francois Prélat uh, in France, 1818. Egg is around 1818. There's a whole debate to be had there as to who invented the percussion cap. But this is a weird side offshoot, alternate universe percussion cap system without a cap. I <laughs> hope that makes, well, it won't make any sense actually. So. Don't worry, we're going to explain. Um, so let's dive straight into that. On the technical side, um, I will just foreshadow that we have some really interesting uh, social history around this pair of pistols. And one other that we have um, that we're coming to in sort of part two, if you like, but um, in the same video. But I want to get the technical side out of the way first um, because it is, well, not get out of the way. It's also very cool. So let me just show you how this operates. So we pull the hammer back, that interesting little widget on the front here pivots, that's in the half cock position. While we're at it, there is a half cock safety bolt as well. I think we've seen those before on this series. Um, if not, there's a little notch in the back of the hammer, the safety bolt engages with that and it locks it in place uh, at half cock, ready to just um, pull out safety, pull it to full cock and fire. But when I did that, you'll have seen that this weird bottle shaped device canted even further to the back or cocked further to the back. And they are connected. If you haven't spotted it from that side, it is a bit hard to see with this curved arm. Whenever you pull the trigger or pull the hammer back. The two things are operating in concert. Now, some of you will be already trying to fathom why that might be. So what the heck is this? The hammer we can we can intuitively grasp. Uh, it has a quite a pointy nose on it. If you've seen percussion hammers before, that well, firstly, they're usually shrouded, recessed, so that you're, uh, when you hit the cap, if it splits, the parts aren't gonna fly out. And it's also gonna, um, keep the hot blast of the cap exploding from your hand or, or finger or, or whatever. So that's the typical percussion hammer. This is not a typical percussion hammer. It actually has a replaceable nose. So it's a, a loop and a screw in replaceable hammer nose, which is interesting in itself. Under that, and I'll have to, this is gonna be very hard to see. We'll get you a close up. Uh, with photos if we have to, but under that hammer nose, there is a tiny little recess. Think of it as a tiny pan, like on a flintlock, because that's kind of where I'm going with this um, ramble. <laughs> so have you figured it out yet? Well, if you've seen um, that there's a, a big book coming out soon on the Collier revolver, um, those among other designs of flintlocks have what's called a magazine frizzen. So as well as a, a strike face for the flint, it has a little magazine of ignition powder. This is a percussion version of that. So I've probably given you a frame of reference that you haven't heard of, which isn't very helpful, but nonetheless, if not, this is literally a bottle missing. They're both missing their lids, which is really annoying, but they, it, this, this is threaded in the top for a lid to keep in what's in here, which I've actually been puzzling about right up until filming. So these are actually catalogued on our system as pill lock pistols. Um, that would require little, maybe one to two millimeter 
balls of uh, mercury fulminate. This is the stuff that the Reverend Forsyth applied to firearms ignition uh, systems in 1807 with his, his patent. And then in 1818, uh, sorry, 1816, um, Joseph Manton came up with a pill form of this shock sensitive compound. When you smack it, it explodes. Same idea as, what, as what's in the primer in a modern cartridge. This is described therefore as a pill lock system or a pellet lock system. Um, just quickly, to, you can imagine fiddling with um, even the copper caps on a cold battlefield, bit of a nightmare. Well, imagine doing that with tiny, even more tiny, fragile lumps of essentially a form of gunpowder, really, uh, in simple terms. So you had to have really something like this. This is a, a Charles Moore patent priming tool with a little rotary dispensing system. So in here is a radial series of little holes, each containing a, a little uh, pill, very tiny. See how tiny it is from the, from the nozzle. And you would drop one of those into the pan effectively on your gun or pistol, cock it and fire it. That's the pill lock system. However, I am not by no means convinced that we're right in calling these pill lock because in this case set is as well as a tiny little flask that would have contained black powder for actually charging the pistols, the main charge, and then ramming the bullet down, of course. And the rammer is on the gun, as is typical. As well as that little flask is an even tinier little flask that still contains, or did contain, um, when we bought it, little grey granules. They're much smaller than a pill, but they're clearly not black powder, and they're in a different flask. So I am pretty convinced that this little, this magazine would have contained those, a measure of those granules with a little screw on lid that's now missing. And so just to, just to emphasize how this is actually working, that little magazine is sitting here. You bring it all the way to full cock. That's dropping an amount of those granules into your little pan. And the two metal surfaces are sort of semi, pretty well sealing each other off. There'd be a little, little trace amounts of dust, I imagine, from this system, whereas the pill would be a bit, uh, a bit cleaner, but still, still going to dispense, just like the magazine frizzing on the collier, a tiny amount of this uh, ignition compound into that tiny pan. Then when you pull the trigger, as well as the hammer falling, a lot faster than I'm going to let it fall, striking the compound, creating a, a tiny explosion, it's also shoving the magazine out of the way to let itself do that. So tiny little explosion. And then if you can see, there is a breech plug running all the way through. So that little magazine pivots around a cylindrical plug. You saw the back end of it, or the front end of it just now. The back end of it is where my finger is. And that is sort of transversely placed through the breech of this pistol which means that little tiny little explosion, the fire from that is, isn't just flashing through a touch hole, it's going through a more slightly more complicated um, horizontal vent. But think of it, it's still, still a touch hole at the end of the day. It's just that it's been drilled right through the barrel and this cylinder has been installed around which your magazine pivots. So a little bit technical, but um, Pretty simple in operation. Charge up your magazine, charge up your first gunshot, and then obviously you have to keep recharging once you've fired a shot. But then whenever you cock, you're priming your own gun. Really quite clever, a significant, um, well, a significant advance over having to, I think, having to use a primer to deposit a pill into the pan and better than having to have a separate priming flask that you're having to tap an amount into the pan with. This is, this is a, a pretty slick system. Clearly it's not as good as percussion cap and that was coming along pretty swiftly. So, uh, so date wise, um, these are not, they have small amounts of silver on them, but they're not visibly hallmarked. So we can't give a precise date, but we believe around 1830. And the general style of these things fits that as well. They are well half stocked, octagonal barrel, um, the various, Decorative flourishes are pretty much of that period, 1820s, 30s. And we also can partially date based on the maker, 
which is that sort of part two that I mentioned. Now that maker is, well, I'll show you what's on the barrel. The top barrel flap on both of these is inscribed Patrick Liverpool. There's a whole Patrick family making firearms in the uh, late 1810s to early 1830s. But this is by the, uh, the woman gun maker, female gun maker, Anne Patrick. And I, I wouldn't normally have to preface the, with the gender, but um, it, it's sufficiently unusual um, that, uh, that I have. <laughs> so this is Anne Patrick. She's probably the best known of the female gun makers um, that we know of. Uh, we know of perhaps more than you might think. Uh, in fact, uh, the, through, from the 1500s through to the, the 1900s, the typical percentage of uh, women gun makers in the overall pool of gun makers, very much a male dominated uh, trade, as you might imagine, was between three and 6%, which, I, I, which was higher than I thought it was going to be, to be honest with you. And what we typically find is that, uh, well, gun making is a family trade, much like most um, pre-industrial or industrial trades. And so when the, um, the male owner of the company, because if you're sufficiently good a, gun, a maker, you, you, you own your own company, when they pass away, the widow takes over for a period of time. Now, in many cases, that's a short period of time, but in many other cases, it's not. So Anne's father was called Jeremiah. Um, she, by 1821, she's taken over at 45 Strand Street in Liverpool, where the, the family business is based, the workshop is. Um, so she, she's slightly unusual in that she did not take, she didn't take over from a husband, she took over from her own uh, father, but indirectly. Her brother was the, was the, I guess, the first heir to, to, to pick up the company, but there was a big fire at the workshop in 1817, and um, that's probably the main reason. He, so he was not successful running the Patrick, the already successful and well-regarded Patrick gun making company. So he steps down, she takes over as, um, well, I guess second choice in, in the, um, um, it's probably how, how it went. Well, maybe it, was, it might've been done on age. We don't really know. We're pretty sure that she was actually working, um, working as a, uh, you know, filing components, assembling guns along with the, uh, other family members and employed um, staff of, of the Patrick firm and then took over and it wasn't a sort of case of emergency. Well, I guess it was semi-emergency and she was taking over from a, a failed version of the company, but not the same kind of you'll do situation that did happen for some um, female gun makers. So a, a really fascinating um, slice of history, I think. Now, uh, history would suggest that these would have been made at the 10 Pool Lane site, um, which are presumably they moved because of the fire. And I'm not 100% sure about that. And in fact, the label in the lid does give us the address. While I'm at that, it also tells us that the Patrick Company are uh, gun makers to His Royal Highness, the Duke of Gloucester, which is a nice, uh, another nice facet to this uh, whole little family story. Um, well regarded. At the time, high end, bought by um, you know, wealthy customers by default. I mean, this is, these are these are expensive items. So um, Anne's company doesn't just go away. She sells up after after about twelve years in the trade uh, to uh, Williams and Powell, um, which has to be the same. I think the same Williams as Thomas Williams, who is her new husband. She she marries uh, marries him, takes steps back, sells the company. Now, of course, we don't know the details. Why not? And there's a lot of, um, I and mean, this is true for, for male gun makers as well, but there's a lot we don't know about basically everyone except for the really famous ones. We don't get uh, you know, portraits or um, later on necessarily photos of them, so we don't know what they look like. We get very little in the way of biographical details. You're having to piece this together from uh, trade directories, um, census records, 3D evidence like this. But, um, but we, know, we know enough to know who Anne was and what she was up to. Um, just to dovetail back in slightly with our dueling pistols episode, check that out if you haven't seen it before. These would classically probably be described as dueling pistols as well. They are what I would call target pistols. So um, half stocked octagonal barrel, slightly stylistic, but also helps with, with balance. 
This is a, a, a late 1820s, early 1830s style of grip, which is pretty close to some early revolver grips. And to my eye, at least, looks a little bit continental. Um, some of the French pistols have this um, semi-cylindrical, well, ovoid shaped grip with this uh, slightly flamboyant cap on the end. Uh, but, the, but these are definitively um, English in, in style. Uh, a spur on the trigger guard to help with steadying the aim. Checkering on the on the grip for, for better grip. You'll recognize some of these features from the other video. A set trigger. So there's a tiny little screw inside the trigger guard where you can dial in the trigger pressure just right for effectively a hair trigger to disturb the sights as little as possible when you pull the trigger. Not rifled, which is still pretty common at this time, but we do have a fairly nice set of sights. So dovetailed into the front and the rear are recognizably you know, somewhat modern iron sights, literally made of iron in this case. At the breech, uh, this isn't really relevant to the to the target setup. This is more for convenience for cleaning, but we have a what's called a, a standing breech. So I'm not gonna mess with these today, but uh, if you were to drive out this key here, this flat pin effectively, the barrel would just lift off and it's hooked in to that fancy um, improved percussion is what Patrick calls it on their lock plates. Improved with an apostrophe in oldie timey, uh, slightly oldie timey English. So the barrel hooks into that fancy breech. The breech stays where it is as part of the stock. So you can hook it out, clean it out more easily, uh, and then just hook it back in and drive your key across. A little bit like taking apart a, a, a Colt percussion revolver, say. So by way of Tying together the two aspects, the technical and the social history, um, we have another pair of Patrick pistols. Uh, happily, both of these sets are on display, so if you come and visit us, you can go and see them. These normally live in the war gallery upstairs, um, right next to the First World War, by weird coincidence, but well, well, not weird, weird juxtaposition, I should say. And the other pair live in our self-defense gallery. And the other pair are a cap percussion lock system, or cap lock if you prefer, the, the standard type of percussion that I was talking about at the beginning of the video. And they are also circa 1830. And we know from other um, arms that have been sold, uh, as, as a high profile gun maker, Patrick made everything, so, you know, pistols, shotguns, almost certainly you name it. They were still selling flintlocks in the early 1830s as well. And they were offering conversion so um, I've seen uh, for sale a conventional uh, sort of drum and what's called a drum and nipple conversion for a normal percussion cap with also improved percussion written on the lock plate. So this is not the name for this system. That's just literally improved percussion ignition. So all these different systems in place and you could go and get your nice flint lock or even potentially these converted to a more modern form of ignition. Uh, normal percussion being the obvious. Your style, you might be a bit out of fashion, um, you know, showing off in the drawing room or on the range. But if it's high end stuff that, you know, you've, you've spent a significant chunk of salary on, you'll convert. So it's maybe a little bit like the 1980s um, video wars with Betamax and VHS in that if you bought this in 1830, you were already obsolete pretty much. Um, not to cause any flame wars in the comments about uh, video technology. Um, but unlike that, where you'd have to buy a whole new system to buy into the new technology, if you're an early adopter of this, don't worry, because they can convert it for you. Um, still cost a fair bit to do that though. So interestingly, although we have this sort of three to 6% of, of women gun makers pretty much throughout history from the, from the beginning of the 16th century, um, and there are some I've identified um, in documents from, from Germany as well, or what became Germany from the 16th century. Quite a high percentage there as well. Interestingly, in, the 18, in 1841, so decade after Anna stepped down, the percentage has dropped all the way down to 1.6%. Um, don't know why, but by 1900, it's back up to uh, more than 3% again. So a, a weird sort of blip there. Um, if you're interested in this bigger picture of, of women gun makers and women in the gun trade generally, because there's more to the trade than just uh, people who actually assemble or uh, make the components, 
I recommend Lois Schwara's book, Gun Culture in Early Modern England, which is just fascinating anyway, and it has a substantial chunk dealing with this uh, interesting aspect of, of, of the women. Um, also, uh, DeWitt Bailey, uh, Bailey and, and Nee's book, English Gun Makers, uh, more of a directory of, of gun makers, but it includes a bit more on the percentages and who's doing what. The fact that they're being admitted to the, the gun makers um, guilds, the gun makers company. Uh, and that they have they have certain status in other ways they are sort of held back so so there's the, it's quite a nuanced subject it's it's very interesting um i'd recommend that you check out those sources uh, you can also if you haven't got easy access to these published sources or there's always interlibrary loan then come to our library here at the armories um there is also an online article on Anne patrick uh, featuring a a shotgun that she made that's on Vintage Gun Journal, so you can just Google that up. But we'll put a link in the description to that, actually, um, and the full references for the books as well. We always like to try and remember to give you the sources on this series. Exciting news for those of you who are not aware of our upcoming weekend firearms uh, event here at the Royal Armouries in Leeds. Um, as part of that, we're doing uh, What Is This Weapon Live, which is really quite exciting to be a part of and hopefully to attend as well. Um, on the same day, so 11th of March, we're going to be having a meet and greet with me as part of the event. And we've actually sold out the first batch of tickets, but the good news is that we are releasing a load more. So at time of recording, there are tickets available for that meet and greet. I'd love to say hello to some of you, um, and I look forward to doing that on the 11th of March.